Uh, and we will get into the crossover now. We are now joined by Don Taylor and Rick Dollywall uh, from Donnie and Dolly on Check TV. Monday to Friday, 10 to noon on Check. The crossover is brought to you by Basant Motors, home of over 400 pre-owned vehicles. And where the players go, Rick, Donnie, how's it going today, fellas? Lovely. Good, guys. Very good. Uh, all right, so we have some actual uh, legitimate Canucks news to talk about today, which is fantastic, given this massive layoff before the Stanley Cup Finals. So uh, the additions to the coaching staff or the changes to the coaching staff, they promote Yogi Shavkoski to assistant coach. He was previously the skills coach. And on top of that, Henrik and Daniel Sedin will be, quote, more involved in the day-to-day -day coaching activities in both Vancouver and Abbotsford, uh, Rick, we can start with you. What uh, what can you tell us about the, the thought process going into these moves from the Canucks today? Well, it's hard to think. First of all, it just happened. And second of all, I think all of us, and, and Thomas alluded to this, I think we all expected Tockett to probably interview. There's a ton of assistant coaches in the NHL that are looking for jobs. There's a lot of guys that have been fired in the past year that are looking for jobs. Uh, just take a look at who Travis Green hired uh, in, in Ottawa. Yep. So there's a ton of people out there looking for jobs, and the Canucks went in-house. Did it surprise a lot of people? Yes. Uh, Yogi Sevskoski, I'll tell you, is, uh, and Thomas, you touched on it too. His And Donnie and I both know because of minor hockey and uh, mm -hmm. his uh, reputation in the lower mainland is absolutely phenomenal. He runs the... Uh, the BC Bears program in the spring, um, you know, so many pro players and, you know, kids getting ready for the Western Hockey League, kids, kids coming out of the Western Hockey League draft, kids getting ready for the Western Hockey League draft, all go to Yogi. He's one of the top go-to guys in the lower mainland for skills, uh, for guys that want to fine-tune their game, get better in the summer. Hey, call up Yogi. Let's get her done. We know his reputation in the lower mainland. But I also want to say, and Thomas, you touched on Dakota Joshua. Well, if you look at Dakota Joshua's last 10, 15 goals, a lot of them were very nice goals, a lot of nice touch around the net. Well, one of the reasons is is is, is the skills coach, and that's what he does. He improves players, touch around the net with repetition and all that stuff. I thought, um, you know, and, I, and I've also heard over the course of the last two years that uh, they are very happy with Yogi as the skills coach in Vancouver and in Abbotsford. Uh, yes, he's got no uh, coaching experience at the NHL level or the American League level, uh, but guess what? He's going to get it now, and uh, I fully expect him to run the power play. Uh, he'll be the guy there. Uh, look, it's, 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 they thought we're going to go internally. They did it, and now it's, uh, time will tell uh, how this thing goes. I, I, after every – well, Pretty much every game, after every uh, uh, practice, you listen to Rick talk at talk. We all, we all do. Listen to the uh, entire interviews. How, and how many times, Thomas, have, have we heard – I don't know if he could pronounce his last name well, but we heard Rick talk at refer to Yogi. He, he, did, he has done that a lot, a lot over the last season and a half. Always refer, and, and I think you know, he has surprised him. You mentioned the lack of NHL experience yeah. uh, for, for Yogi, but I, I get the feeling, just the sense, that Yogi has surprised Tockett by how effective he's been. A couple of other things. You know, they make this move, and it's promotion from within. I wonder if Yogi got offers from other organizations. So there's that. The other thing, Rick, too, you mentioned that how well-respected he is yep. in minor hockey circles around here. You mentioned the Bears but also uh, South Delta Minor Hockey, the yes. Delta Academy. South Delta Minor Hockey has won the U18 A1 Provincial Championship the last three years. Yes, and a lot, of those kids, a lot of those kids are the product of, of Yogi and the clinics that he runs during the season and in the summer. 100%. And um, I mentioned the Delta Academy as well. He's really well. And I know minor hockey is a different ball of wax. But uh, I, you can just tell that he's very well respected at the NHL level a, a, as well. He's been around for a while. Yeah, and so, so congratulations. I, you know, I, I mean, a lot you of also never hear about that. Nope. Yeah. Well, Go ahead, Dred. So go, go, yeah, go, he, Thomas. Go. No, congratulations to him. And obviously, you'll never hear a bad word said about his character either, which I, I do weight heavily. And yet, mm. you know, aside from some integration onto Don Hayes' coaching staff during his time with the Giants, I, I mean, Rick, yep. you said he, he yep. hasn't had assistant coaching experience 
at the NHL level. Like, I don't know that you'd say he has at the major junior level necessarily either, although it looks like he did have the title assistant coach for a bit. Um, in terms of being on the bench and being a full-time assistant, you know, it, it's a pretty big step up for a guy who's never done it. And given that the club has also, you know, brought in Manny Malhotra to be the head coach of their American League yeah. team, I mean, you've got some prominent roles in the Canucks coaching staff that were held down by guys who had a lot of experience, right? Call it and had been an NHL head coach. Mm -hmm. Mike Yo had been an NHL mm -hmm. head coach in two different stops, an assistant for 30 years. And and now they're, you know, turning to some really sharp quality people, but quality people who've never really done the jobs yet. Uh, do you think that's anything, Rick? Is there concern? Is there buzz uh, about how the club has decided to approach uh, filling some pretty prominent roles on talk its staff? I don't think uh, there's concern, but I think there's a lot of surprise. Uh, you know, I, we didn't see Jamie, Jamie Colleton going. Let's be let, let's be honest, guys. Uh, Mike Yo, we didn't see him leaving, and all of a sudden, you know, uh, all this coaching shuffling is the last thing anybody expected after a great year, and yet they got a new coach in Abbotsford, they got a new coach in Vancouver, and as you said, not a lot of experience. Uh, but I, it just it's it's not. I think I, I think people are more surprised, Thomas, that we're we're going through this shuffling of coaches. And one of the areas I thought the Canucks were most stable with in the last two years was coaching. And now we've kind of had some, you know, turnover, which I don't think anyone expected. I, I, certainly us. I don't think we expected this turnover at the coaching yeah, and, level. And I, I just want to get your take on this, Thomas, also with the Yogi reportedly being in charge of the power play uh, versus Tockett, which was the case last year. But Yogi's a skills guy, and I, I, I'm just wondering about, you know, when it comes to the X's and O's of a power play, if the Sedins are getting uh, an increased role, mm -hmm. wouldn't they be a more logical choice to, to run the power play? The, the, nothing against Yogi, but it just seems his area of expertise uh, lies elsewhere in, in the past. Yeah, it's interesting, and I think it also dovetails with something that we did see last year. I mean, the Canucks made some unconventional choices in filling out their staff in in Rick Tockett's first full season, right? I mean, a head coach running an NHL power play directly is not common. Um, Sergei Gonchar coming and going as, as a part-time assistant coach, but then being on the bench when he's around, that's not common. And... You know, if the season had gone a different way, maybe those would have been things we talked about. But we didn't really talk about it until the power play let down uh, in the postseason because until then, the Canucks power play, yes, it looked stilted mm. in the second half, but it worked. They were, you know, top half of the league, top 10 for much of the season. And the power play went nuke for a couple months at the start of the year, which earned the club, I think, a lot of grace to struggle a as the year went on. So, you know, I, I do think Tockett's staff, the way that, this club has managed talk at staff has has already been subject to some interesting decisions some eyebrow furrowing bets from the club and you know i, I guess this is a, an extension of it it's just that when you think about just the level of experience and, and presumably compensation uh that would have been represented by the likes of call it and yo and, and sort of consider what they've brought in to replace it it's certainly something that makes me go hmm well, and the Sedin side of this is interesting as well, right? Because, you know, just looking at the at the Canucks website and they have the changes here, they have Yogi as, a, as an assistant coach, you know, the Sedins are still listed under player development, but we know already, I think they were much more involved on a day-to-day -day basis than, you know, player uh, people in other organizations who have the player development title. Now it's saying they're going to be even more involved, right, with both Abbotsford and Vancouver. And look, it, I, you know, I just find the Sedins kind of career arc fascinating you go back to when they joined the uh, club under Jim Benning and it was kind of in a front office role uh, seeing how they like things there now it's on, on an on ice role and you know Rick as I, I know you said it just happened so maybe you haven't had a chance to really work the phones on this but uh, I think it's going to be interesting to see what a bigger role on a day-to-day -day basis translates to for the Sedins in the in the next season 
Well, they got, uh, they're still young. They can still climb the ladder any year after this year, or two, three, four years down the road. They're here. They love it in Vancouver. This is their, this is where they're going to live. And, and, but you know what, uh, when they were first hired, uh, Jamie, a lot of people said, you know, this is just a gimmick move or, you mm. know, you know, this is just, you know, but you know what, that's not true. These guys have done a wonderful job. And if you're any organization in the league and you can say to your farm team, that we got Daniel and Henrik that are going to work with your top prospects. Like, how many teams can say that? I mean, that's pretty good to have these two guys working with the young kids and teaching them. How, who was it the other day? One of the uh, – oh, we just had – we had Josh Bloom on today, and he talked about um, – you know, his time in Abbotsford and he brought up the Sedin twins and how cool it was for these guys to give him tips and, and stuff like that. So the Sedin twins have all the opportunity in years to come to climb the ladder and do whatever they want. But I, I like the role they're in right now, Jamie. There's no rush in moving up. They don't have to be head coach or GM or assistant yep. coaches. They like what they're doing and they're doing a damn good job of it. Yeah. And, and Thomas, you mentioned that some of the things they're doing um, are unusual I, I like the idea of, uh, with, with Gonchar, let's start there, with, with Gonchar coming in every once in a while, part-time, going on the bench, it's different. You know, you got veteran players uh, mm -hmm. there that might, might appreciate a different uh, approach. And the Sedins every once in a while. Guys, it's an 82-game schedule, preseason, training mm -hmm. camp, playoffs. Players get tired of the same voices over and over. Rick Tockett will tell you that over and over again. You bring in a guy every once in a while, I think, are they the right guys? You, you could argue that. But I think that if, if that's indeed what they're thinking is, I like it. Just bringing in a different voice. And I think people will respond to that voice more if they don't hear it every single day. Absolutely. With, uh, I want to talk to you, Rick, about your Ian Cole report, a uh, scooplet from you today. What are you hearing on Ian Cole and what does it mean for the composition of the Canucks defense? Well, it looks like, uh, as of now, it looks like Ian Cole is going to hit the free agent market. Uh, if you guys remember, last summer signed uh, that one-year deal at $3 million. Um, The two sides have been talking. They, there's been contract talks, but I think the Canucks would need Cole at a much lower number than three. And uh, it doesn't look like uh, the Canucks will uh, be able to re-sign him after some contract talks took place last week. Two sides could not find common ground. It just looks like, look, he's getting up there in age, right, guys? And they brought him in for leadership. Alvin Rutherford, uh, you know, and Tockett, they knew him from the Pittsburgh days. You know, he's got over 1,000 games in the NHL. He was the one player on the Canucks with the most uh, playoff games experience. Uh, he was great in the dressing room, great pro on and off the ice. All that stuff was great. But here's where the Canucks are. They've got a ton of UFAs. They've got a ton of free, uh, yeah, RFAs who all need, everyone's got their hand out for a raise. The only guy that doesn't got his hand out for a raise is Myers because he's going to go from six to three. Everybody else, all the agents are saying, hey, we played a big role in helping the Vancouver Canucks have their best year in 13 years. And no one else has taken a, a pay cut. But I will say this, the Canucks absolutely love Ian Cole and what he brings. Cole wanted to come back. I just don't think the numbers can work. And as of now, it looks like he's uh, he's probably going to hit that uh, July 1st uh, free agent market. And, and I think, you know, on Ian Cole, the – he struggled in the playoffs. I think it's fair. And he became the target of a lot of ire from Canucks fans. I know you had the report as well, but he was dealing with an ankle injury, uh, Rick, on the show, on your show today. But let's not forget, for much of the season, I mean, he was a really important p part uh, of this blue line. You mentioned the experience, but his value on the penalty kill, the minutes he was able to play. We've all been focused on, you know, Zadorov and Myers and uh, Philip Ronick, but it's not necessarily going to be easy to replace all the things that Ian Cole brought to the team this year either. Yeah, and the other thing with Ian Cole is that he was the lefty who was – and the playoffs aside, the ankle injury and all of that and the odd uh, hiccup here. But he was comfortable playing on the right side, which which they needed. And it, it just seemed – I don't know what you guys think, but uh, it just seemed that as the season wore on, especially in the playoffs, maybe a little confidence was lost in mm. Noah Juleson. Although Rick Tocchin yeah. talked him talk, talked him up a lot during the during the regular season, but it was pretty valuable to have a lefty that could play fairly effectively on, on the right side in, in Ian Cole. So I think you know, uh, despite what a lot of people might think, given what happened in the playoffs, he's going to be pretty hard pretty hard to uh, pretty hard to replace. And then plus he the, the players would talk a lot 
uh, about how when things were down, it was Ian Cole who would yep. who would settle things yep. down in the dressing room and come up with a veteran uh, a veteran speech that really uh, that was really effective and and worked the next time out. Well, and it's no surprise. I mean, I mean, you guys have heard him interviewed. We've we've talked to him on the station a lot. Like he's oh, he's so an incredible yeah. talker, so insightful oh. and just upfront, candid. Like just a pleasure to talk to and, and learn about hockey from. Uh, so yeah, I mean, why, it's no surprise it, that the why, players. Why, why is it, uh, Jamie and Thomas, that the 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 Canucks do not put more value, place more value <laughs> on us on players who are good to the media? <laughs> like like on, on us, absolutely. I never like. I don't know if you saw this Josh Bloom kid today on our show. Like, sign him right now. Sign he, him up. He would be top a top three interview, and I think that should be like that should be a top three priority for the Canucks when you're signing somebody. So Hronik out, on. Cole in is what you're saying, Dottie. <laughs> sure. I'm, well, hold on a second now. <laughs> you like the Hronik thing? Hard. You did, yeah. I I like the Hronik interview. I'm okay. <laughs> That got numbers for us, and I know you guys feel the same way. It, well, you know what though, I for, it's it, it's different for radio because that was one you had to see. Yeah, yeah that's I mean, true. If, if looks could kill, Jeff wouldn't be around anymore. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, Rick. The other yeah, thing man. I wanted. To, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Rick. I, I wanted to say about Cole. I, I know he took a lot of heat, especially in the Edmonton series, but I, I do want you guys to know. Uh, he got his uh, skates tangled up with uh, Evander Kane in Game Two, mm-hmm. and he got yep. eight stitches uh, on his ankle. I I don't know if you guys have ever put your foot in a boot and skate with eight st- eight stitches. It's not a lot of fun. It's it's freaking painful. The, you know the th- the stuff that guy had to do to get every game. And I know. Look, if I don't come out and say that he had an ankle injury, you know, the the easy thing always, especially on Twitter is to rip and tear without knowledge of what's going on. And yet you do it all the time. <laughs> Stop it. But the, the, thing that, that the thing that Twitter does is that we don't want to know what's behind the scenes and what, what's causing this guy's play to go south. But he had a pretty significant injury. And, he didn't, and, and, and I'll give Ian Cole credit. He was asked in his availability, just like uh, Hironic, and just everybody else, were you, did you play hurt? And he said no. So you know what? Every player on that day had a choice. They knew they were going to be asked about injuries. Some guys said we were injured, and some guys said we were not injured. Yeah, I mean, one thing about Cole, too, is he literally was – in the medical room in gear on occasion after morning skates in that Oilers series, which, you know, I, I wasn't there, sure what was there going on you there. Go. But, but now that we know the context, now that we understand that he was dealing with a pretty severe cut, I mean, it took real guts to suit up every night in that series. And I don't think people yeah, should forget well, and, either and people... the calm defensive game yeah. he brought all season. Really, with his best yeah. games coming against Nashville in the playoffs before that injury yeah. kind of caused him to maybe uh, struggle a bit, in my opinion, in that Oilers series. Yeah. Okay, and and people don't know this uh, either, but there was an incident, I think it was after game two, he was going on a walk, and he hurt his ankle. He twisted his ankle. (laughs) What is this we're hearing, Thomas? Thomas, uh, you You were on a walk today down in L.A., and by the way, how long have you been down there? Like seven years? I was on a... And you... can you move, I was can you do a, us a favor a, and move uh, to LA full time? I was on a mountainous climb, Donnie, and uh, it was um, oh. a, a trail that's not like that well packed. And uh, yeah, it just gave way. Mm-hmm. I got too close to the edge. wasn't paying attention. Was maybe a little dehydrated. Uh, and yeah, had a had a fall. It was not one of those funny falls. You know what I mean? Like you know uh, when you fall. In, in, in whose opinion? Uh, that, not funny oh, yeah. to you. I've been there. No, no, no. I was with I was with the sorts of friends that I fell and I could tell that they didn't think it was funny and that's how you know that's how you're like oh my god am I hurt? That's bad. I wasn't. And yet here you are right now. Look at this. He's fighting. Are you in a Are you in a walking boot? Are you in a walking boot? No, I'm I'm not athletic enough for a walking boot. Well, then suck it up. I am. Well, he is. But I but I am going to uh, put my feet up and ice. Half hour on, half hour off, probably for the rest of the day. Okay, hold oh. on. I, I have a real, I have a real question I want to ask Rick before we, uh, before we wrap this up here. I know Elliot yeah. Friedman was on with you guys earlier in the week, mentioning the Canucks working hard to try to clear salary, 
And the way I interpret it was that maybe, you know, trying to clear multiple salaries off their books. I think we all think we go right to Ilya Mikheyev, of course. You know, they I'm sure they would love to yeah. find a way to move that contract. But, Rick, do you have any sense? Are there are there players that they have under contract beyond Ilya Mikheyev that they might be looking to move to, to create create some salary cap space? Did hear that they're they're trying to move guys uh, to clear up cap space so they can sign the Zadorovs and the Joshuas of the world. Mikheyev is obviously your easiest number one target, right? And mm-hmm. they are trying to do that. They they got his name out there. I don't know really, uh, 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 Jamie. Any others that I can think of that are point blank? I mean, Heronik's name you're hearing uh, a lot. You know, can, you know that's possibly good money you could clear up if you can move that. It's, especially if you're not comfortable with his ask, which is eight million a year. Yep. Uh, that would clear up some say, but the the one name you do here is Mikheyev, and you know what? But have fun, have fun trading a guy who has one goal in fifty one games, and is coming off a major knee surgery. Have fun doing that, and you don't have a first or a second round pick in this year's draft to throw in for a sweetener. So exactly, how would you do that? It's going to be tough. It it, it's tough, fun, Rick. Well, maybe yeah. maybe somebody's intrigued by the one goal, one goal. <laughs> <laughs> At least he didn't go for a walk, but. Yeah. Uh, one goal in 59 or 60 games, uh, whatever it is. But uh, that knee injury, maybe somebody would still see something there, knowing that it takes a long time but Donnie, to, to get completely yeah, healthy. To take that like contract, back it's going to cost a sweetener. I, yeah. I just yep, uh, yep. They, they don't have anything to put in a sweetener right now, nothing. Uh, all right, we'll wrap it up there, guys. Thank you for doing this, as always. Uh, we'll, chat, we'll chat next week. Be careful out there. Thomas, Thomas, put some A535 rub on there. You'll be okay. Yeah, yeah on a cut. Good idea. <laughs> no, he said it, the muscle. Put oh, it on the sprain. muscle part, it's Thomas. Call me later, Thomas. Call me. Call me. To, uh, call we'll me do. later, Thomas. I'll give you some advice. All right. That is, that is Don Taylor and Rick Dollywall from Donnie and Dolly on Check TV. The crossover brought to you by Basant Motors, powering the playoff drive, home of over 400 pre-owned vehicles, and where the players go.